happy if you worry, don't break. My homie told it to me just the other day. From the tall castle walls to the mean teeth streets, I hope you get what you want and that you want what you need. I mean, thank you. Everyone have a seat, be comfortable, relax. I, 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 I gotta tell you, let's go, let's go. Thank you. I need you guys to know something. And I'm gonna tell you the truth, and don't get freaked out. This is gonna be my last special for a minute. It's all good, it's all good. Listen, listen to me. I, I did it in Detroit for that reason. That's right. You wanna know why? Because I talked so much shit about Detroit in the first special, I figured I might as well do the last special here. Sorry about that, by the way. <laughs> First of all, before I even start, I want to say that I'm rich and famous. <laughs> and, and, and the only reason I say that is because the last 17 months were hell, and I cannot imagine what everybody went through, but I'm happy to see you, and I'm happy you're well, and I hope everyone you love is okay. I don't want you to worry about me. I'm, I'm vaccinated. I, uh, I got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I gotta admit, that's probably the most niggerish decision I've made in a long time. <laughs> I walk in the doctor like, give me the third best option. I'll have what the homeless people are having. <laughs> yeah, so far, so good. And I know you probably heard on the news, I did, I did get coronavirus. And it was, it was something else. Like, okay, first of all, when the doctor told me I had coronavirus, I, I gotta tell you, I was surprised how it made me feel. I felt dirty. I felt gross. Cause I had been walking around Texas, just touching doorknobs and shit, hands all moist, Boy. tipping niggas with cash. Here, take this to your family. I must have killed thousands of people just trying to get tonight's show together. So I hope you appreciate it, cause a lot of niggas died for me to get this one off. I hadn't felt that dirty in a long time. The last time I can remember feeling dirty like that, man, I must have been a little boy. I was being molested by a preacher. Oh, well, don't feel bad for me. I liked it. I used to get a kick out of coming in that fella's face. Well, he asked me to do it. They make a quarantine. I had to quarantine for 10 days at least. They said, you're gonna have to stay in the room. I didn't go nowhere. And, and, and it started making me nuts because I would just sit in the room and, and watch videos all day. Now, you know what I was watching? And I hate to say this, but there was a lot of videos, sadly, of black people <laughs> beating up Asians for no reason. <laughs> oh, these attacks were unprovoked. I couldn't believe it. And I was sitting in the room watching this shit. It was stressing me out. I was stressed already because the whole time when you get coronavirus, at least the first five days, you wait to see how sick you're gonna get. And it turns out, and this is true, I didn't get sick at all. <laughs> not a cough, not a booger, not a fever, nothing. Look at me. I am the Magic Johnson of coronavirus. <laughs> I just sat in the crib and got strong all week. But I was stressed because I kept watching these videos of my beloved black people beating up my beloved Asian people and being so cruel. And the whole time I watched those videos, this is fucked up, but I couldn't help but feel like 
uh, when I saw these brothers beating these Asians up. It's probably what's happening inside of my body. I didn't get sick. <laughs> I also saw a lot of videos of UFOs. I mean, what the fuck has been going on with that shit? These niggas are here. These UFOs keep coming to Earth, and it made me think of an idea for a movie. It sounds dumb, but hear me out. In my movie idea, we find out that these aliens are originally from Earth that they're from an ancient civilization that achieved interstellar travel and left the Earth thousands of years ago. Some other planet they go to and things go terrible for them in the other planet. So they come back to Earth, and decide that they want to claim the Earth for their very own. It's a pretty good plot line, huh? I call it Space Jews. Space Jews. All right. It's gonna get worse than that. Hang in there. <laughs> it's gonna get way worse than that. Then I thought of an idea for a children's book. I actually wrote it. It's coming out soon. The book is designed to help parents teach their children about racism, which if you're a parent, you know is an impossible concept to teach to a child. But I'm doing it. The book is about a big, strong, beautiful black man with a benign, regular-ass white name. And he has a white speaking voice. So whenever this motherfucker calls to get a reservation at a restaurant, oh, he gets the reservation. <laughs> that name and that voice, who could resist him? Now, I should tell you, this black man is literally an actual giant. And he's a strong dude. And when he shows up to them restaurants, they see that big, giant black dude, they say, you can't come in here. And, and, and they call the police. <laughs> and, and, and in every installment of the book, the police come and, and they always shoot him. But remember, no, no, remember, this guy is a giant. These bullets don't kill him. They don't even hurt him. They just break his heart. It's called Clifford the Big Black Nigger. Anyone? That's right. And after this shit, it's time to make America wait again. <laughs> I've done too well. You know, if you black and show business and do too well, it's scary, nigga. Like, you gotta get the fuck out of the casino while the getting's good, while you're still winning. If you don't walk away from the table, that's how niggas get Kevin Harted. <laughs> you already know. That's my man, I'm just saying, if he got a sex tape out, well, it's just a matter of time for me. <laughs> but you know why I be thinking sometimes I wanna stop doing comedy? And, and you know, I don't wanna sound like a braggart saying this, but the real like reason I wanna stop is because I'm too goddamn good at it. <laughs> I'm dope, nigga, like, no, I'm not even, I'm not even exaggerating, I'm, it's not exciting. <laughs> Every night before I come out on stage, I'll be backstage like, I'm sure this is gonna go well. <laughs> and it always does. <laughs> I'm so good at writing jokes, and this is not even an exaggeration. I actually write jokes backwards. I will write a punchline with no particular setup in mind. I'll just put it on a scrap of paper and I'll throw that scrap of paper in my uh, fishbowl. I have a fishbowl in my house filled with random punchlines. And every once in a while, I'll shake the bowl and I'll dig in there and just pull one out and see if I can make that shit work. <laughs> and I picked one for this special. It's not an easy punchline to pull off. Are you ready? Yeah. 
here it goes. The punchline is, so I kicked her in the pussy. I haven't finished the joke yet. I just know whatever happens in the beginning of the joke, at the end of the joke, for some reason, I'm gonna kick somebody in the pussy. And it's going to be hilarious. And you know what's weird? I've always been this talented. I can't remember a time when I wasn't. You know, when I was growing up, I was probably about eight years old, and at the time, we were living in Silver Spring. Yeah. Yes. Common misconception about me in D.C. A lot of people think I'm from the hood. That's not true. <laughs> but I never bothered to correct anybody <laughs> because I wanted the streets to embrace me. As a matter of fact, I, I kept it up as a ruse. Like, sometimes I'll hang out with rappers like Nas and them, and these motherfuckers will start talking about the projects. Yo, it was wild in the PJs, yo. And I'll be like, word, nigga, word. But I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> My parents did just well enough so that I could grow up poor around white people. And to be honest, when Nas and them talk about the projects, nigga, I used to get jealous. Because it, it sounded fun. Everybody in the projects was poor. And that's fair. But if you were poor in Silver Spring, nigga, it felt like it was only happening to you. <laughs> Nas does not know the pain of that first sleepover at a white friend's house. <laughs> And you come back home on Sunday and just look at your parents like, y'all need to step your game up. <laughs> Everything in Timmy's house works. <laughs> Remember the first time you saw that? In a cold winter, and you'd be at a white friend's house and see the motherfuckers in their living room without their coats on? Timmy was one of my first white friends, like, in my life, man. He was a good dude, too. He moved to Silver Spring from Utah, of all places. I guess his family was affiliated with that Mormon church they got down there. And me and him used to hang out. And one day I was at his house, we were just hanging out, and, and Timmy says, Dave, why don't you stay for dinner tonight? I said, oh, man, I'd love to, but I can't. If I'm not home before dark, my mother will kill me. That was a lie. <laughs> My mother had several jobs. I hadn't seen her in like three or four days. <laughs> and the only reason I lied to Timmy was because at that point in my life, it was my experience that white dinner wasn't delicious. <laughs> I'd rather go home and fry some bologna or some shit like that. But then old Timmy threw me a curveball I wasn't expecting. He said, well, it's too bad you can't stay, Dave, because um, mom uh, made stovetop stuffing. I said, what the fuck, stovetop? Well, hold on, nigga, let me make some phone calls real quick. I had seen that commercial so many times, I had dreamt of getting my hands on some of that stovetop stuffing. And finally, I met a motherfucker that actually had a box of stovetop in the house. I couldn't miss this opportunity, so I pretended to call my mother. And then I came back and I said, Timmy, Timmy, you're not gonna believe this great news. Mom said I can stay. And he said, fantastic. He said, why don't you come with me and we'll help set the table and then we can say the blessing. I had no interest in setting this motherfucker's table or saying these crazy ass Mormon prayers. I just wanted that goddamn stuffing. <laughs> so I told Timmy, I said, you know what? I'd love to help, but let me go wash my hands first. My plan was simple. Wash my hands slowly, and by the time I'm done, the table will be set, the blessing will be said, and all that there will be left to do is eat. <laughs> Went to the bathroom. I washed my hands very slowly. I must have been in there for about 10 minutes. 
And suddenly, one of his mothers came to the door. <laughs> she was like, hi, David, right? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, Timmy tells me that you're planning on staying for dinner. I said, I hope that's not a problem, ma'am. She says, no, it's no problem. In fact, we'd love to have you. It's just that we weren't expecting company. And I'm afraid there's not enough stovetop stuffing <laughs> for everybody. So I kicked her in the pussy. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> she got a picture, okay? Like, say I'm in bed, I'm sleeping. And suddenly my wife wakes me up. David, David, wake up. And I'm like, oh, oh, look who's coming around. And I pull my dick over the top of my pajamas. <laughs> and she says, no, I hear something. I go, oh, this bitch. So I get up out of bed, <laughs> grab the gun. I say, wait here, baby, I'll go check it out. Just lock the door behind me. Oh my God, she's right, right there in the kitchen is a heroin addicted white, and <laughs> he's digging through the change job by the door. Hmm, hmm, I worked really hard for that change. I gotta do something. So first, I wrap the shotgun. Hey, motherfucker, click clack. <laughs> That's a test. That click clack sound will stop a rational human being in their tracks. But sure enough, this person is not rational. They're sick on drugs. They're digging in the change. Hmm, hmm, I gotta act fast. This nigga's almost got a dollar fifty. I warned you, Berkshire. And there goes. Hot BBs will permeate his yellow heroin skin. Remember, I'm not killing him. I'm just peppering him up nice. He lets out a heroin scream. Yeah. <laughs> and that should be the end of it. But, uh-oh, I miscalculated. While he's on the ground screaming, I noticed that his teeth are horribly miscolored. That's not heroin at all, is it? That's crystal meth. He pops right back up, unscathed. <laughs> Rawr! Time for the heavy stuff. Clack, clack, buckshot! <laughs> and then if you got a friend with him, I got one more bird shot left, and I repeat the cycle. After that, nigga, it's slugs for everybody. <laughs> and I'll be in a kitchen full of dying heroin addicts saying stupid heroin last words. <laughs> uh, uh, mm, you shot me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> It hurts, man. It hurts. Uh, the last words are always the dumbest words. Like, uh, why is your dick out? <laughs> I'm just afraid of being attacked. Happens to the best ones. Don't ever forget what happened to that French actor. You know what I'm talking about? Juicy Smouillet. He's a very French, very famous French actor. <laughs> Y'all never heard of Juicy Smouillet? <laughs> Juicy Smouillet is an actor from France. And he became famous on a show called Empire. <laughs> One night, he was in Chicago late at night and was the victim. <laughs> he was the victim of a, a racist and homophobic attack. You see, Juicy Smouillet is 
gay and he is black, not just French. <laughs> oh, it was a crazy story. Apparently, when he was walking down the street late at night, two white men came out of the shadows uh, with MAGA hats on, beat him up. Tied a rope around his neck, called him all kinds of niggas, and, and put some bleach on him and ran off into the night. <laughs> this shit was like international news. And everybody was furious, especially in Hollywood. It's all over everybody's Twitter feed and Instagram page. Justice for Juicy and all this shit. The whole country was up in arms. He was talking about it all the time on the news. And, and for some reason, uh, African Americans, we were like oddly quiet. <laughs> we were so quiet about this shit that the gay community started accusing the African American community of being homophobic for not supporting him. But what they didn't understand is that we were supporting him with our silence because we understood that this nigga was clearly lying. <laughs> None of these details added up at all. He said he's walking down the street in Chicago and, and uh, white dudes come up to him and say, hey man, aren't you that faggot nigger from Empire? A, a fuck? Does that sound like how white people talk? I know white people. They don't talk like that. Are you that faggot nigga from Empire? They would never say that. It sounds like something that I would say. <laughs> if you're racist and homophobic, you're not even gonna know who this nigga is. You can't watch Empire. Black people never feel sorry for the police, but this time we even felt sorry for the police. Can you imagine if you was a police veteran taking this kid's police report? Okay, Mr. Smoulier, please tell me what happened. All right, you 2 a.m. You left the house at 2 a.m. It's minus 16 degrees. And... All right. You were walking. You were walking. All right. And, and where were you going? Subway. Sandwiches? <laughs> That's when the men approach you? Did you see them? Do you have any? Okay, what do they have on? MAGA hats! MAGA hats on in Chicago? Excuse me one second, Mr. Smoulier. Yeah. Frank, come here for a second. Find out where Kanye West was last night. <laughs> Such a fucking outrageous story. He said they put a rope around his neck. Has anyone here ever been to Chicago? Yeah. All right. All right, so you've been there. Now tell me, how much rope do you remember seeing? <laughs> Who the fuck is carrying rope? Like, when did you get mugged, nigga, in 1850? Who's got rope? <laughs> Who's got rope? <laughs> Man, that shit was awful. So, okay, I'm doing a show somewhere, and I'm on stage, and I was a little drunk, you know. And I figured, fuck it, let me talk about that nigga a little bit. I figured to be safe, because, you know, everybody's phones are locked up. <laughs> and I went in on this kid. I was talking all kinds of shit. Now, I didn't know that there was a journalist in the audience. And unfortunately for me, that motherfucker took impeccable notes. <laughs> He told everybody everything I said. He was even putting the jokes in the headline. The headline said, Dave Chappelle says he wants to smash a dollhouse over Juicy Smouye's head. <laughs> and I 
thought for sure when I read that headline, I said, well, that's it for me. I'm canceled. <laughs> but lucky for me, that very same day, the Chicago police caught the motherfuckers that actually did it. And hilariously, they were both uh, Nigerian. <laughs> not only were they not white, they were very, very black. They were Nigerian, which is the funniest shit. The whole story is funnier now. This is MAGA country, you faggot nigga. <laughs> you faggot nigga. <laughs> if, if you're in a group that I made fun of, then just know that I probably will only make fun of you if I see myself in you. I make fun of poor white people because I was once poor. And I know that the only difference between a poor black person and a poor white person is that a poor white person feels like it's not supposed to be happening to them. <laughs> Everything else is the same. I know what it's like to have a cold house. I wasn't allowed to touch the thermostat growing up without asking my father. And it would be fucking freezing in the house. I'd be like, Dad, please, can I please just turn the heat up to like, I don't know, 32, nigga? It's really cold. <laughs> and my dad would say, just put more clothes on, David. Got all three of my outfits on, nigga. Will you look at me? I'm freezing up here. And he said, just don't think about how cold you are, David. And I said this, I didn't say it to him, but I said it in front of him so he could hear it. I said, I fucking hate being poor. <laughs> and my dad got really upset. He didn't scream or holler, that wasn't his way. He just threw his newspaper on the floor and he said, David, 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 you are not poor. He said, poor is a mentality. He said, it's a mentality that very few people ever recover from. Don't you forget it, son. You are broke. <laughs> he said, these are just financial circumstances that I hope to overcome one day very soon. And I said, well, Dad, whatever you want to call this, uh, it's wildly uncomfortable. There was a big dance coming up in the middle school. I was 12 years old. I said, Dad, can I go to the dance? He said, of course you can go to the dance. I want you to get out and meet some more kids. I said, great. Uh, it costs $3 to get in. And my dad said, ooh. <laughs> Sorry, son. Uh, I don't have it. I was like, what the fuck? You don't have $3? Well, then how are we alive, Dad? I wish I found some way out of this hell. I'd do anything to not be poor. I will show Michael Jackson my anus if I get a chance. <laughs> I just gotta get out of this hell. <laughs> Dad said, if you wanna go to the dance bad enough, I'll tell you what, there's some money in the change jar, get the money from there. I was 12 years old, that's what I did. I showed up to the dance early. There's a long line of kids waiting behind me while I'm at the door trying to count out 300 pennies to get inside. I will never forget this shit as long as I fucking live. Oh, man, you know, if you've been poor, you know what that feels like. You were ashamed all the time. Feels like it's your fault. And all them kids was laughing. Ha, 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 ha. Look how poor the age pal is. <sighs> like, when I think back at it, that's really the only time in my life that I ever thought to myself, I should kill everybody at school. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, and good night. Got loyalty, got royalty, and this is what I say. Got more damage to young African Americans than racism in recent years. I never got my fucking life.
is where you guys should applaud and go crazy. I'll wait. <laughs> I see why you wear these. They are so comfortable. <laughs> look, look at this room, y'all. Look at this room. Look at the people we got here at this party. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Comedians, actors, and musicians are all here for one man. We're all here because Dave brings people together in a way that maybe no one else in the world can. I met Dave over 20 years ago, and we've been friends ever since. Dave, you have always been my mentor, my big brother, and uh, every time I step on stage, every time I think of you, because um, I've always want to make you proud, because you the GOAT, you know you the greatest. <laughs> what I love about Dave is his spontaneity. Um, my favorite story with Dave was on Christmas, one year after I finished feeding the homeless at the Laugh Factory. I do that every year because I never forget where I came from. Not the Laugh Factory, homeless. homeless. <laughs> Dave called me to meet him for drinks. And when I arrived, I see him there with Marlon Wayans. And I was like, what are y'all fathers doing here on Christmas? Shouldn't y'all be with y'all kids? And Dave said, who are you, Scrooge? Bitch, have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> so we laughed and joked till about 1 a.m. And Dave was like, y'all want to go bowling? And we were like, ain't no bowling alley open on Christmas this late? Like, what, what you talking about? And he started laughing. He said, uh, do you realize I'm Dave Chappelle? <laughs> He made a phone call, and then we jumped in his SUV, and then we started going up this hill, and then we pulled up to these huge gates. I mean, huge. I was like, are we finna be bowling at Jurassic Park? <laughs> we get out the car, go to the door, and guess who opened the door? Guess who opened it? I said, gas, bitch, gas. <laughs>
like a gladiator. But maybe that's the only time that I feel like myself. At 19, he's the youngest comedian in Star Search history. From Washington, D.C., here is Dave. Man, come on, man. Come on, man. I don't know if Ed mentioned this, uh, I was recently on black entertainment television. I kind of have a feeling most of you haven't seen that. I... I don't know why. I used to think all white people were happy <laughs> just to be white. I thought y'all sit around fucking egg, I'm white. <laughs> this feels great. <laughs> Taxi, <laughs> just check out. I spoke at my old high school and I told them kids straight up, if you guys are serious about making it out of this ghetto, you gotta focus, you gotta stop blaming white people for your problems. And you've, you've got to learn how to rap or play basketball or something, nigga, you're trapped. You are trapped. Either do that or sell crack. That's your only options. That's the only way I've ever seen it work. You better get to entertaining these white people. Get to dancing. I used to watch a fucking cartoon when I was growing up called the Care Bears. <laughs> they were like teddy bears, but they were like people. And they all fucking just walked around caring. They cared about each other and everything else. And when shit got real bad, they got determined. Hmm. And the leader would say, come on, guys. It's time for the Care Bear Stare. Remember that shit? And them little teddy bears would lock arms and stare at the problem. And I'm not even bullshitting. Actual love would shoot out of their chest. <laughs> and when we grew up, we wanted to be like those babies. And then we got our hearts broken. Because we found out that life wasn't going to let us do that. And that it's impossible to shoot love out of your chest. <laughs> However, I have shot love onto somebody's chest before. <laughs> <laughs> 